November 2nd is International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. The UN recognised day shines the spotlight on the extremely low global conviction rate for violent crimes against journalists and media workers. Now, over the last uh, 11 years, more than 900 journalists have been killed for bringing news to the public. Just one in 10 cases has led to a conviction. Well, International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists marks the death of two of our colleagues. You can see them on your screens now from our sister station, Radio France International. They're the French journalists Giseline Dupont and Claude Verlain. Both were killed while reporting in Mali in 2013. Well, as well as being killed for uh, bringing us uh, news, media professionals have been uh, thrown behind bars. Others have fled their home and are now living in exile. France 24 has met a Turkish journalist who's uh, found refuge here in Paris. Living in hiding. This tiny room is home to a journalist in exile. He wants to remain anonymous, fearing that Turkish authorities might recognize him. He was on holiday when the military failed to overthrow President Erdogan last year. He decided never to set foot home again. I spoke to my friends during the newsroom meeting. I thought to myself, they are going to close the newspaper. The least I could do was to talk to my friends to take a decision, maybe even say goodbye. I asked them, what do you think? Should we return home or not? And they replied, no, don't come back, it's too dangerous. That evening, the police stormed in and closed the newspaper. The former reporter used to write for a newspaper opposed to Erdogan's regime. He says he's a wanted man. I'd get arrested if I tried to return home. There's always the fear of being arrested because there's no freedom of expression. I have a critical mind. That's the journalist's spirit. But for that, I'm going to be thrown behind bars. In just one year, around 150 media outlets have been closed in Turkey. More than 100 journalists are awaiting trial in jail. The House of Journalists is an NGO based in Paris that welcomes the oppressed. These people take huge risks to bring us the news. They suffer, they're in prison, they're gagged, sometimes they're caught in self-censorship. Some have died doing their job, but that's not a well-known fact. For the Turkish journalist, the only option left is to ask for political asylum in France. In the meantime, he visits Paris with other reporters who share the same fate. They consider themselves lucky. This year alone, more than 50 journalists have died on the field. Well, joining us for today's uh, debate is Abdallah Bozkurt, president of the Stockholm Centre for Freedom, author of Turkey Interrupted uh, Disrailing Democracy. We also have on the set with me Hélène Salon. She's a journalist at the French newspaper Le Monde. She's been out and about in Iraq and Syria um, covering the Islamic State group. All right, Abdallah, welcome to you. Hélène, welcome to you. Good to have you both. Abdallah, if we start with you, we saw in that report, uh, is it fair to say that uh, journalists uh, put themselves on the line for doing their job is becoming ever more prevalent in Turkey. In fact, they do. The Turkish journalist that you just interviewed in your show is only one of the 133 journalists the government is going after. They remain fugitive either in Turkey or they fled country and trying to find you know safe haven in other uh, countries. And that uh, doesn't include 254 journalists behind bars uh, as of today. That's amazing number. It's unbelievable. It's surreal. So and unfortunately, there's, uh, there's a lingering impunity uh, in the face of this massive crackdown on the Turkish media. And the, the Turkish government is just, you know, trying uh, to paint a, a, you know, a bullseye on the back of these journalists who fled Turkey. Uh, and uh, in my case, for example, the Turkish government news agency, they just, uh, you know, publish a poster like the one we see in the Western movies. I am being fugitive. I am living in Sweden and they are trying to hunt me down. So it's kind of intimidation campaign uh, on the part of the Turkish government, even if you are living in exile. So they want you to shut up, not to write critically of the government on the issues that really uh, interesting to the public opinion. So are you saying that the only uh, choice, essentially, for uh, Turkish journalists who don't agree with the government is either to leave the country or face persecution where they are? 
No, I mean, uh, the number speaks for themselves. 254 journalists in prison as of today. And there are so many uh, who are, you know, uh, the government is actually looking for. And there are so many, you know, uh, not behind prison, but they are facing criminal uh, prosecutions in Turkey on what we see at trumped up charges. The opposition, independent and critical media is effectively killed in Turkey. And the, the, the ones that we still, you know, see working on the ground with a lot of challenges and difficulties, they face, you know, uh, pending uh, threats all the time and uh, imminent imprisonment in Turkey. Now, let's bring in on the debate uh, Ellen Salon, your journalist at the newspaper Le Monde. You've spent a lot of time in Iraq and Syria, especially Iraq, uh, you, you tell us. Um, you've covered the Islamic State there. Now, we've seen violence perpetrated against journalists there. I mean, James Foley springs to mind, uh, perhaps the, the, the most obvious case. What, what did you see in your time in Iraq around violence uh, affecting journalists? Well, it's it's mostly what we didn't see because the effect of the the arrival of Islamic State in Iraq and Syria that was that we couldn't go anymore because the Islamic State considered journalists not as independent observers but as like actors of a state that they they will take into a stage. So it was a case of James Foley. It was a case of our colleagues in France. Uh, four colleagues we were kidnapped as well in Syria, and some of them were released, some were decapitated. So we couldn't cover the, the caliphate of the Islamic State. It's the first uh, incidence of uh, the caliphate. So it was also a risk to go to some areas where the Islamic State fighters are not so far from, because we could be kidnapped by criminal groups and sold to this uh, Islamic state so fighters. it's working within a, a constant climate of fear, essentially, places that are no-go zones that journalists yeah. know it's, it's best to avoid. Yeah, exactly. We couldn't go anymore. Like Syria, nobody went anymore after 2014. In Iraq, nobody went to, to the territories that, that were held by the Islamic State. We just covered from one side because we had no choice. Now, our guest in uh, Stockholm spoke to us essentially about the government cracking down or repressing journalists within the country. Uh, in Iraq, was it less of the government that was people, journalists are afraid of, more uh, jihadist groups operating? Yeah, of course, jihadist group. And also at the beginning, there was also fear from uh, because you had a lot of armed groups, militiamen, but they got organized under the government and they were really keen to uh, invite journalists to come. But of course, you have restriction to your access. They control the access, like any armed group, army. They will give you a specific access to the fieldwork. But we never faced really a danger from uh, these groups. Maybe in Syria, it was more clear because there was a problem between the opposition and the government. And we had our colleagues, our French colleague, Gilles Jacquier, who was killed in Homs. And the, the investigation is still pending about what it, what went on in this. Uh... Abdullah, if we come if we come back to you, I mean, clearly it's it's not yeah. new to say that uh, violence against journalists is not limited to uh, a few countries. This is happening uh, recurrently around the world. I mean, if we think of countries like Mexico, where journalists are, are often killed, uh, Russia, a number of African countries as well, where uh, there's freedom of expression is being clamped down on more and more regularly. We're seeing in Turkey uh, convictions for journalists, but the other way around when it comes to violence against journalists, convictions are extremely rare, aren't they? Um, it is. I mean, the impunity is lingering on for many years in, in Turkey, unfortunately. I mean, if you look at the names uh, of the uh, jailed journals in Tur Turkey, it's not just random, by the way. I mean, many of them, some of them I know personally, have been investigating the Turkish government links with the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda affiliated groups in Turkey and in Syria. So they are just locking up these journalists and putting them behind bars to, to just, you know, muzzle their voices and stop this investigative work, which is very much valuable to the to the public opinion. And in some cases, unfortunately, uh, the Turkish journalists are not getting killed by the bullets or the bombs instantly, but some of them uh, are losing their health behind bars. Uh, in one case, for example, I know uh, very well uh, the, the, the journalist has collapsed uh, kidneys, but he is not getting an urgent treatment he needs, and the government is not releasing him uh, on the health conditions either. So they are killing journalists slowly behind bars in Turkey.
So uh, a, lot, a lot of violence being perpetrated behind journalists. Now, we, we said at the beginning of the programme that November the 2nd, the day against uh, impunity for violence for journalists, it was essentially born of uh, the deaths of our colleagues uh, who died in Mali uh, four years ago. That investigation, I mean, speaking of convictions being rare, that investigation has stalled as well. Yeah. We have uh, a lot of... Uh Areas we we don't know what happened uh, to our two colleagues. There is a request to the Malian government to uh, bring some uh, new investigation, and we don't have answers for the moment. And we don't know if we will uh, have an answer one day. In terms of your experience in in Iraq, when there's an attack or violence perpetrated against the journalists, the government is pretty much has its hands uh, tied behind its back. There's not much that it can do. Uh, no, when, when it comes to the Islamic State, the problem is to, uh, to find uh, the proof, to go to the area, to investigate, so it's uh, really difficult. Uh, so most of the time we don't have answers to what happened. Abdallah, if we come back to you, in terms of thinking of the initiative that exists at the moment, the projects that are there to protect uh, journalists, do enough of those exist in your opinion? Well, I think they are important to to keep the pressure on the government to find those people who are accountable for the murder of the journalists. Uh, in Turkey, I know, for example, one case uh, almost uh, 10, 10 years ago, an Armenian Turkish journalist got killed, very prominent figure, used to be an editor-in-chief of, uh, of a minority newspaper. Uh, and the government couldn't actually, you know, complete the investigation. And they uh, they keep uh, reshuffling the judges, prosecutors. In some cases, they actually jailed judges and the prosecutors who investigated the murder of the journal journalists. I mean, uh, you need to go after the masterminds, not just the trigger men uh, in these cases. And for that, we need to keep pressure on the government with these advocacy groups and projects that you mentioned uh, and involving of the, you know, uh, the, uh, the government on the bilateral level as well as the multilateral platforms. That, that needs to be you know, uh, an ongoing process to be able to keep this pressure up. I mean, how do we go again about, uh, should I say, bringing justice for uh, violence uh, uh, committed or perpetrated against journalists when at times, as we saw in that report, uh, the, the government, prosecutors, uh, the courts are sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes complicit in these types of things? Yeah, the problem for me is that no, the journalists are considered not at independent observers, but as actors and a part of a policy like we see in Turkey and it's uh, uh, especially on the Turkish uh, journalists, but also some of our colleagues were arrested because they made some report and they are accused of terrorism under terror law. And uh, that's the problem now, that journalists for their work will be uh, investigated, arrested under terror law. And the only way to get them out is the pressure of a government. So it depends on the relationship between governments Pressure exert, exerted, and sometimes our government, like in France, are really close uh, in close ties with uh, some uh, dictatorship. So it's problematic to to have this pressure mm. exerted uh, all the time. We have another problem in Malta, where one of our colleagues was uh, assassinated in her car, and uh, the, the, there is a call note from the European Commission to exert the uh, European Council, sorry, to exert a pressure on the government to lead an investigation. It should be exer exerted. Abdallah, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, one in 10 uh, cases has led to a, a conviction. Uh, it's not very promising, is it, in terms of uh, protection for journalists? Well, it is. I mean, at the end of the day, you need to rely on the national criminal justice system as well as, you know, the law enforcement agencies, including the intelligence services, to be able to bring the perpetrators to the justice. But in Turkish case that I know very well, the criminal justice system has completely collapsed. Instead of going after the perpetrators, it, uh, as my colleague in your show uh, indicated, the government is acting as complicit and bringing uh, the criminal uh, charges against the journalists, you know, independent investigative journalists, to be able to, uh, you know, silence them.
uh, and uh, you know send a message uh, that you, you cannot dig into this you know the murder cases of the journalists you cannot uncover uh, you know dirty secrets of the government security services so i mean uh, uh, at the end of the day you are you are powerless i mean you can take these cases to the you know international criminal justice justice system or in some cases international human rights like the european court of human rights but again you know when you get the judgment like in this case that I mentioned on the Armenian Turkish journalists, the European Court of Human Rights, you know, issued a judgment uh, forcing the Turkish government to open the case and investigate further. But the government is not complying with this judgment, and we don't see any progress in terms of bringing the perpetrators, uh, you know, uh, of murdering these Turkish journalists. So, I mean, again, uh, it depends on the national criminal justice system. And we need to keep the pressure on the governments uh, at the political level uh, to be able to push, uh, you know, uh, and make a progress on these cases. Elena, more than 900 journalists killed over the last uh, 11 years. Is violence against journalists becoming normalized in uh, some aspects of life? It depends what, what we talk about. I think for war journalism, it's one of the part of the job. I mean, uh, being on the front line is really uh, dangerous, and uh, you, we, a journalist can be killed as much as uh, soldiers can be killed. I mean, the actors can be killed. But we have seen more and more violence uh, from uh, other groups, like you talk about Mexico, or you have uh, criminal uh, gangs who are killing the journalists because they don't want them to report. So where you have a volatile situation, more and more uh, different armed groups, uh, criminal uh, gangs, you have more violence. And we see uh, an increase, I, at least in the region I cover in Middle East, this is the case, there are more and more violence and volatile situation. OK, well, that's where we leave it uh, for now. The first half of our debate. Uh, Abdallah Bozkort, you're the president of the Stockholm Centre for Freedom. Thank you very much for speaking to us uh, today. Hélène Salon, you're a journalist at the front, uh, French newspaper Le Monde. Thank you for your time. We're going to take a short break. Uh, coming up, we'll have the second half of the debate for you.